In 1837, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote the Concord Hymn. In it, he talks about the shot heard round the world. What he doesn't mention is if that shot hit anything. Could it have hit anything? How effective was musketry in the 18th century? There's been a lot of debate on this topic, and historians and scholars at Old Fort Niagara are diving into the subject. Fort Niagara really has a sense of place. You just feel like there's this, this importance to where you are. This location allowed the exploration of the rest of the Great Lakes and beyond. Come up the Hudson, you come into uh, Lake Ontario, and then the only way is to go past this site. Look at the history and you see that it was there on the cusp of everything. There is such a rich history here, going back before the Europeans to the Native Americans that were here, the Haudenosaunee. So it kind of resonates. It, it makes you feel kind of awe inside. This is a very old place. It's where people cooked, sleep, fought, everything. It's amazing how you can really understand it once you see it. People in the 18th century, in the 19th century, in the 17th century, they're seeing the same buildings, the same lake, the same river, the same sunsets. That's been going on for 300 years. It's an overwhelming feeling, especially when you haven't been here for a while and you come back again and you're... It's like you're actually there, in the moment. I'm going to enjoy it. There's a feeling that, that you're in an important place here, that this is, this is where things happen. The dogma about 18th century musketry is that it was terribly inaccurate, sometimes to the point of ineffectiveness. There are a lot of people who, who really believe that uh, when, you're, when you're firing a musket, that you are not going to be able to hit anything. It's also uh, often assumed that the, that the men uh, did not have any great deal of instruction in the firing of the weapons, that the training that they had was inadequate, that very little aim fire was employed uh, in combat, uh, and all this is, is questionable. First thing we need to do is to select a manageable piece of the 18th century. The 18th century hosted many conflicts, but for our purposes, we'll be looking specifically at the American Revolution, years 1775 to 1783. During the war, Fort Niagara was a major post for the British Army, where soldiers lived, trained, and launched operations. This makes it a good place on which to concentrate our study. Now, to break down the elements that contribute to the effectiveness of musketry, the weapon, the training, and the soldier. First, the weapon. What weapons are the soldiers at Niagara using? Well, what we have here are some of the weapons that you would see your typical British soldier carrying. The land pattern musket. The first pattern of the brown vest is actually issued in 1717. Not only is it a stout, as in a thick weapon, it's also just a heavy weapon for your infantrymen to be carrying. That proves to be a problem when you're relying on your infantrymen to be able to walk for long distances. Now as we move forward a little bit in time, again, we still have the long land pattern, or the first pattern musket, but a new incarnation. We're gonna notice immediately that a couple of things have changed. The furniture has gone from steel, over to brass. The stock itself is narrower. It's lighter weight. It's more rounded. It's more pleasant to carry. One of the things that we're attempting to do for the infantrymen as we move into the 1760s, 1770s, is just simply to lighten their load. And we move into what's known as the second pattern. This is called the short land pattern. Well, because it's about four inches shorter than the long land pattern. The last musket that I want to show you, and this is, this is the part that really has me excited. This gun was once upon a time used in our interpretive department. However, it is also an original. We can see the production date, but it says 1804. We have a crown with the broad arrow. For the soldiers here in the 8th Regiment, the most common musket out of these four that we have would have been this fellow right here. This is the first pattern, but it's the new pattern. The basic parts, include our lock, our actual working mechanism right here, our wooden stock, and then the metal barrel. The way this actually works, we're gonna pull this back here. 
we would actually put a small bit of powder right in this section here, which is called the pan. We would then close that pan by pulling back this section known as the hammer. As we put the rest of our powder right down the muzzle. Once that powder is in the muzzle, we're actually going to ram that cartridge down using this piece right here called the rammer. We then bring our musket right back up to this position, bring our musket back to full cock, and we're ready to fire. As I pull that trigger, the flint comes forward, the flint strikes that steel. So, we've learned that the standard British arm at the time was the land pattern musket. It comes in several different patterns, but they all share the same basic mechanics, a flint lock and a smooth bore barrel. But how did they use these weapons? With a lifelong career ahead of a man, 20 to 30 years in the army, there was a fair amount of time to invest in training. It is just like learning to do a sport well. There's going to be muscle memory involved, and it means that when time comes to actually be in action, soldiers should be able to bring that muscle memory to bear on this and go through the process without actually having to think about it. A skilled operator could get so a rate of fire of two to three rounds a minute uh, was was fairly normal. Most officers, if they thought about this very carefully, uh, preferred an emphasis on accurate fire rather than very speedy fire. Like in the rest of North America, Fort Niagara is no different in that the British Army is considering firing at marks to be pretty important to the training of the British soldiers. Essentially it's target practice. There is one reference for the British Army when they're stationed near Boston. They even had man-sized targets and they had positioned them actually out in the water and they were pretty happy about them being out in the water because they were talking about that that actually increased kind of the difficulty of them actually hitting it so it was a better form of practice. We can look in Army orderly books and get hard data on this. In preparation for this test, we know from some of the information that we've been reading from um, the research done by other authors that uh, the British Army is actually trained to fire at marks and actually effect effectively do target practice. Um, so we know that that's kind of a general practice in the American Revolution um, in light of some kind of more recent research. And we wanted to see if we could find uh, some examples of that being specifically done here at Niagara so that this can be tied into, um, into the test that we hope to complete. The reference that we are looking for right now is actually one that is um, in the Haldeman papers. It shows up in the, in the card catalog. I'm just looking it up on the microphone here. And it's going to be a, a reference for um, April 19th, 1780. Um, and it seems to suggest that uh, Butler's Rangers, which is one of the um, loyalist ranging companies that was actually um, based here at the fort and kind of being formed here at the fort, looks like they were actually doing target practice um, as part of their training. I think this might actually be the letter that we're looking for. That's actually the reference right there. Some of the handwriting is a little bit hard to read. Just trying to make it out, but so far it seems to say, and it's talking about Butler's Rangers in general here. The Colonel has had his men out this spring Um, frequently firing at marks, etc., etc., agreeable to your excellency's orders. So it's interesting to note that you know even if if rangers are being trained to firing um, at marks, uh, it seems logical to assume that British regular troops are in fact doing that too. It turns out British soldiers were trained to carefully aim and fire their weapons in battle. They even held target practice. Lieutenant Colonel William Dalrymple of the Second Regiment of Foot wrote. For the principle of all firing is to hit the object fired at. Even the best training and weaponry are useless without the soldier himself. Who was the British soldier? Somebody with no other prospects. <laughs> Someone whose economic future is a little dim. In popular mythology, the ranks of the British Army are filled with effectively what Wellington later would call the scum of the earth. Although there's, there's some truth, it's generally pretty unfair. It tends to be farm laborers. It tends to be uh, the bored children of weavers in the countryside. People who recognize that they're basically not going to be advancing at all in station 
and have heard rumors that perhaps you do gain something in terms of social standing by being in the military. If you pulled men out of the ranks who were marching out to Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, most of these men would have at least five years in the army already. When men enlisted in Great Britain, they first spent time with a recruiting party. With the recruiting party, the men start learning the basics of being a soldier, which is things like hygiene and deportment, how to march, how to move like a soldier. After a man has spent some amount of time with the recruiting party, he and other recruits from that party are sent to a place called a depot. At the depot, they receive arms for the first time and start learning this thing called the manual of arms, the very basic movements of how to handle the musket with confidence, how to hold it in the proper places, and drilling on that so it becomes second nature. Most recruits who were sent to America spent anywhere between three months and two years at a depot in Great Britain before being sent to America. So men who were arriving as new recruits in America were not brand new to the military by any stretch. They had already undergone a lot of training. As we know, our typical British soldier is from the laboring class and is in the army for the long haul. He's a well-trained, disciplined career soldier. Now that we know the main elements that contribute to effective musketry, there's only one way to truly test the effectiveness of these weapons. We need to fire them. First, how accurate is a single smoothbore musket in the hands of an experienced marksman? Our first test pits our single shooter against a single target. He'll be firing three rounds at 200, 100, 75, and 50 yards. Um, I'm Graham Langell. Uh, I started hunting and shooting when I was about three years old. For the past five years, I've served with the United States Marine Corps Reserves, for which three of those years I was a designated marksman. The farthest distance I've ever shot was 800 meters. That was with a M14, 308. So it's going to be quite, quite different going from that aspect to a musket. So I'm very interested to see how they perform. So you can get somewhat close to him. I mean, that's kind of be to be expected, though, at that distance. Oh, oh, right over here, too. Nick the edge of this board. Makes you wonder how they did it back in the old days, you know? This one, excuse me, right here, was taken at 100 yards, another one at 100 yards, and then getting closer down here. So, as you can kind of see, it's getting a little bit more accurate as we move up in range. All right. Well, our new three holes at 75 are down here, here, and here. So, and obviously it's just kind of basically a front sight post on the musket. So it doesn't really give you a good right to left or even like elevation you can do decent, but the right to left on the uh, shooting with that is a little bit difficult. And I was aiming center mass on all three shots. Let's see what it does at 50 yards. Let's take a look. Well, this was at 50 yards, and the accuracy is tightening up, but not good at all. Um, we got a flyer over here, and this is a new one. And then we have another one right here. So, what I was noticing, I was noticing that the rifle was going a lot to the right. Obviously, you can see right here by all these holes. So, what I started doing is I was actually 
on that course at 50 yards, I started aiming for the center of here and trying to hit them in the in center mass. But to be honest, I have no idea where that one came from. According to these results, it seems like soldiers couldn't hit much with weapons from the time. But as we've learned, armies used masses of fire to inflict damage on their enemies. And one gun doesn't qualify as a mass of fire. So what we've done is gather five soldiers from the Fort Niagara interpretive staff. Now, obviously, these aren't true British soldiers. But as interpretive staff, they practice with these weapons and tactics on a daily basis and are the closest equivalent in our modern world. They'll face off against six soldiers from the Continental Army's Northern Department, or at least targets that represent those soldiers. Our soldiers will fire three volleys at each yard line. Hits will be recorded and color-coded while the soldiers move through the distances. Blue for 200 yards. Green for 100 yards. Orange for 75 yards. And white for 50 yards. Now, there's no way we could ever create the true stress and chaos of battle, but a stiff run, smoke bombs, and firecrackers can help. Open order, prime and low! Big ready! Present! Dear God. I know, right? Good, we, God, we left him untouched. Nerve-wracking, absolutely nerve-wracking. First off, we're all sweaty, and you got stuff running in your eyes, so you can't really see, and the smoke's clouding your vision. And the constant go, 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 keeping your heart rate up, keeping the smoke on. Now, obviously, you're never gonna get, quite get the conditions that they're having in, um, in the 18th century, but I think that this was um, probably a closer proximity than, I mean, I don't know of anybody that's done a closer proximity. Well, based on what I see here is, I mean, we always say that, all oh, these are so-so inaccurate, but you get out to 200 yards and you're seeing people are hitting something. Just to see that you're starting to um, inflict some wounds at 200 yards, I think is pretty interesting. So let's see how they did. At the 200 yard line, there was one hit. At the 100 yard line, five hits. The 75 yard line, four hits. And at the 50 yard line, eight hits. With misfires included, this gives us a hit percentage of 7.7% at 200, 33.3% at 100, 28.6% at 75, and 66.7% at 50. Clearly, the closer the soldiers got to their targets, the higher their success rate. These results show that while, yes, hits were scored at the 200-yard line, the percentage is so small that it may not be the most effective use of ammunition. On the other hand, the 50-yard line, which saw the most hits, puts enemy forces incredibly close to one another. It is truly the situation a unit finds itself in that will dictate the right course of action to take. With this in mind, we found that these weapons, when massed together, can be very effective. People would tend to look at the, the weapon's shortcomings in terms of its rate of fire and uh, its reliability uh, in terms of rates of misfires in, in bad weather. Uh, and they would tend to judge the weapon to be inadequate and yet, effectively, this was the best, the best technology that could be offered to the troops for that time period. This gets into the, a very common problem with studying history, 
is that we tend to compare then to now rather than look at the time period in the context of itself. History is not a static field. It's constantly changing, and every day something new is discovered. We'll never know if the shot heard round the world hit anything. But now we have a better idea of what the men of the American Revolution faced, which is an important part of the story of our past.